We're good. A slide change, huh? All right. At this time, we'll call the January 11th, 2022 planning board meeting to order. It's been a little bit of a makeshift situation. We're going to forego the pledge tonight and jump right into item 2A, which is the approval of the meeting minutes from the December 20th, 2021 planning board meeting. The purpose of this agenda item is to consider approval of the meeting minutes of the planning board on December 20th, 2021. Has everybody had a chance to, to review those? If so, are there any corrections or changes that I have a couple of comments? All right. Um, when the um, when the land use program amendment, the words were um, presented. I had said I had questions something about the church. I don't remember the verbiage, but that wasn't in there. Hmm. Um, I remember planning staff replying, responding to it. And the other, I did not see, I saw in the beginning um, that uh, town, Assistant Town Manager Jim Seymour was, was here. But then in the meeting, um, there was some conversation between Mr. Seymour and the planning staff, and that wasn't in there. I think that's just real important to show that okay. we're all working together. And right. I think he just provided a summary of the land use right. update. So we'll go back and look at it. Luckily, it's recorded, so we can go back mm -hmm. and check. Okay. Well, Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the part that's independent of the announcement where it says this is time there was more than that. Okay. Eva, you got all that? I do. All right. Anybody else got any more changes? Yes, if not, Barbara, do you want to make a motion on that then? I'll make a motion to approve with amendments. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? All right. Aye. 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 All opposed? There we go. All right. At this time, we'll move into the public hearing section of the, the meeting. Um, public hearings are a time for petitioners to present requests for the public to state their concerns and voice their opinions in favor and opposition to, the, to these requests. And at this time, I'll ask the planning director to review the meeting protocol for public participation that relates to this meeting. Thank you. Tonight's meeting is both in person and virtual, contains a public hearing. Due to the hybrid nature of the meeting, the public will be invited to participate both in person and virtually via the Zoom virtual meeting platform. When it is the appropriate time, staff will call on those wishing to speak in support or opposition um, attended in person, followed by those wishing to ask a question or make a comment via the Zoom platform. All attendees that have joined the meeting virtually have joined muted. If those joining virtually wish to make a comment, they will need to notify the Zoom meeting host that they wish to speak. For the public's benefit that may be joining the meeting via Zoom, Please press the raise hand button in the Zoom app to notify the meeting host you wish to speak. Please press star nine to raise your hand if joining by telephone. <laughs> After an individual has raised their hand, they will enter a queue. When the time for the virtual participation begins, staff will ask the meeting host to recognize individuals that have notified them that they wish to speak by calling out either their name or the last four digits of their telephone number. Individuals will be unmuted one at a time and invited to make their comment. We ask all those wishing to ask a question or make, a, or sorry, to make a comment to begin their remarks by clearly stating their name and address for the record. This concludes the protocol for tonight's meeting. All right, thank you. This time we'll move into public hearing item number 3A, which is the zoning map amendment and land use plan amendment. From Gray Metlin, I'm gonna so apologize if I butchered that, from Wakefield Development at 8537 Lake Wheeler Road. And a portion of pin 06894559964 REZ 2021-10. The purpose of this agenda item is to consider a requested zoning map amendment for a total of 35.49 acres located at a portion of Lake Wheeler Road from the Residential Agricultural RA Zoning District to the Planned Unit Development PUD Zoning District and the corresponding Land Use Plan Amendment from Mixed Use Neighborhood MUN to Mixed Density Residential MDR. At this time, further information will be presented by staff. Do I ask for recusal now? Yes. I make a motion that Jim Challenger be recused. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? You are recused. On to you, Pam. Thank you. I am submitting the agenda abstract and supporting documents into the official records of the town. 
The subject properties totals 36.52 acres, of which 35.49 acres are part of this rezoning petition. The subject property is located in the town's extraterritorial jurisdiction. The property is the subject of annexation ANX 202108. The subject property is generally forested with a single family residence located on the western side. The subject property is zoned residential agricultural. The petitioner is requesting approval to rezone the property to a planned unit development zoning district. Planned unit developments are intended to permit variations and flexibility to create a unified development plan that would otherwise not be possible under the land development ordinance. A planned unit development is intended to address urban design, meet the demand for all types of housing, integrate residential and commercial uses, encourage conservation and more efficient use of open space, protection of environmentally sensitive areas, enhance recreation and activities for healthy living, promote a pedestrian friendly environment with well-designed and coordinated streets for pedestrian walkability. The petitioner has requested the following site specific conditions be made applicable to the subject property. One, vinyl siding is not permitted. Two, fiber cement will be used on all exterior elevations. Vinyl windows, shutters, soffits, decorative elements, and trim are permitted. Three, front facing garage doors shall have windows, decorative details, or carriage style adornments. Four, a varied color palette shall be utilized on all homes throughout the subdivision and shall include side, trim, shutter, and accent colors complementing the siding colors. Five, all homes shall include architectural shingles and a color that complements the development's approved color palette. Six, attached townhouses will consist of a mix of four, five, six, or six unit buildings. More than 50% of the buildings will not have more than five units per building. Seven, attached townhouse and units shall include a minimum roof overhang of 12 inches. Eight, all homes shall have a front door with a minimum 25% glazing, transom, and or door side lights. Nine, right of way visibility. Any side or rear facing facade visible from a public right of way, existing or proposed, shall have a covered or enclosed porch and or decorative trim or shutters around all windows. 10, roofs shall be pitched at five to 12 or greater, not including porches or bay windows. 11, townhouse roof lines cannot be a single mass, it must be broken up horizontally and vertically between every two units by staggering the unit a minimum of 24 inches or providing a minimum eight inch vertical step between every two units. 12, a masonry material shall be provided along the front facade of all homes, equivalent in height to two standard steps or a minimum of 14 inches. 13, front entrances for all homes must have covered front porch or stoop area at the front door. 14, no home can be constructed with either an exterior elevation, front facade, or color palette that is identical to any other home in the same row for townhomes or the next home on either side for single family or directly across the street for all attached and detached homes. 15, a minimum of three of the following exterior materials or elements shall be used on each house. Decorative shake, decorative porch rails and posts, shutters, one by four window wrap, decorative window pediments, recessed windows, side and or front window box bays, decorative brick or stone, decorative gables, decorative dormers, decorative cornices, metal roofing. Proposed residential materials. Number 16, proposed materials will be of a similar palette to provide consist consistency of character along with visual interest. Exterior materials that may be incorporated into any of the residential structures include fiber cement lap siding, board and batten siding, shake and shingle siding, wood siding, so stone or synthetic stone, and brick. And 17, a minimum of two of the following exterior materials will be applied to the front facade. Brick, masonry, board and batten, horizontal or shake siding. Alternatively, the front facade of a building may be comprised of all masonry. A master plan is characterized by an integrated mixture of civic spaces, single family detached homes and alley loaded detached and attached townhomes. It provides for an overall integrated design that considers the placement of residential types, connectivity, character, transportation options, and preservation of natural features. To comply with the zoning map amendment petition requirements, the associated master plan, both document and related maps, shall identify permitted uses, arrangement of uses, open space, thoroughfare network, utilities, pedestrian network, 
and architectural design and standards. The master plan shall also adhere to all other standards provided by Article Q and Appendix D of the Land Development Ordinance. The petitioner's master plan proposes a maximum density of 3.38 dwelling units per acre with a maximum of 120 units, excluding the lot designated for the pump station. The proposed density is less than the maximum allowable density of six dwelling units per acre. There is a proposed minimum of 55 attached townhome units that will have a minimum lot width of 20 feet, 20 detached townhome units that will have a minimum lot width of 30 feet, and 32 single family detached lots consisting of 10 8,000 square foot lots, five 10,000 square foot lots, and two 12,000 square foot lots that are to be located adjacent to the Ridgebrook Bluffs community. The single family detached homes are intended to provide a transitional area from existing single family neighborhoods to the north and east of the site to the higher density townhome units. Civic space is green space dedicated for community use and can take many forms for both active and passive recreation. The master plan proposes a number of civic space, including natural play areas, shaded pedestrian seating, a fire pit, grilling area, a dog park, pet way stations, and general open space areas. The minimum open space required in a planned unit development is 20% of the gross acreage. The proposed master plan provides for dedication of 40% or 14.35 acres of the project area to be open space, with an additional 1.89 acres of active recreation area. All homes will be within 500 feet of an active recreation area. Surrounding properties are generally residential in nature with some forested areas. The Ridgebrook Bluff subdivision is to the north and east of the subject property, while the village of Lake Wheeler subdivision located to the northwest of the site is currently under construction. Additionally, to the southwest and south of the property is the construction of the I-540 Southern Expressway. The 2035 Community Vision Land Use Plan designates the subject property as mixed-use neighborhood. Since the requested zoning is incompatible with the designation of mixed-use neighborhood, the petitioner has included a land use plan amendment as part of this zoning map petition, which will be described later in this report. Public water is available to serve the subject property. Sewer will be extended as part of the development. The subject property is located along and has access to Lake Wheeler Road, which is classified as a 110-foot right-of-way by the 2035 Community Transportation Plan. The Community Transportation Plan identifies this street as a four-lane median divided roadway with side paths with a future carrying capacity of 36,600 average daily trips. Currently, the street is a two-lane roadway with a carrying capacity of 18,300 average daily trips. 2019 NCDOT traffic counts taken on Lake Wheeler Road approximately a quarter mile south of the subject property indicate an average daily trip count of 8,200. The future I-540 Southern Expressway currently under construction runs diagonally along the south southwest border of the subject property. This expressway will not have an interchange at the intersection of Lake Wheeler Road. The petitioner held two neighborhood meetings on October 26, 2021 and December 1, 2021. The meeting reports are attached and staff takes no <clears throat> position as to their content. The 2035 Community Vision Land Use Plan calls for the subject property's mixed-use neighborhood classification. Mixed-use neighborhood neighborhoods include housing types and residential densities integrated with commercial, non-residential goods and services in a walkable center that residents visit daily. The general mix of uses envisioned for a mixed-use neighborhood includes residential and commercial uses. The scale, character, and intensity of development in a mixed-use neighborhood should be compatible with and transition to adjacent land uses. The petitioner has proposed a land use plan amendment from mixed-use neighborhood to mixed-density residential, as the petitioner believes rezoning to mixed-density residential to be more compatible with the surrounding properties. Land classified as mixed-density residential is land formed as a neighborhood for a mix of housing types and densities. Homes are oriented interior to the site and typically buffered from surrounding development by transitional uses, topography, preserved open space, or landscaped areas. Typical densities in a mixed density residential neighborhood range between four and eight dwelling units per acre. All neighborhoods incorporate a comprehensive network of open space to accommodate small parks, gathering places, and community gardens, preserve tree stands, and help reduce stormwater runoff. Land classified as mixed density residential does not require the integration of commercial or non-residential goods and services. 
In fall 2021, the town began updating the land use plan to ensure the intent and goals established in 2017 when the land use plan was adopted are consistent with today's emerging development trends and the community's vision for current and future land uses and developments. The town staff is confident that the petitioner's request to change the land use plan from MUN to MDR is inadvisable at this time. Staff recommends that the request be denied until such a time as final recommendations and guidance is available from the updated land use plan, which is expected in early spring 2022. Upon adoption of the updated land use plan, staff would encourage the petitioner to reapply under the guidance of the newly updated land use plan. Staff recommends denying the proposed zoning map amendment and associated land use plan amendment. It is inconsistent with the 2035 community vision land use plan and is not reasonable or in the best interest of the public for the following reasons. One, staff cannot support an amendment to the land use plan while the land use plan is being updated and therefore cannot recommend a rezoning request that would also require a land use amendment. Two, staff currently agrees with the town's land use plan that the subject property should be designated as mixed use neighborhood, thereby incorporating commercial uses into the site, which is consistent with the town's goal of strategically balancing the total blend of residential and commercial uses. Staff is reluctant, however, to provide a supporting recommendation at this time until the updated land use plan is available. This item was tabled at the December 20th, 2021 planning board meeting at the request of the petitioner. Since this meeting, town staff has not received any updated project related information and the petitioners has requested the petition be presented to the planning board with the town staff's recommendation for denial. I am available to answer any questions. All right, thanks a lot. Does anybody have any questions for Pam before we, we hear from those in favor and the applicant? No? At this time, I'll ask anybody that wants, wishes to speak in favor of this zoning map amendment and land use plan amendment, please come forward, state your name and address and um, they're trying to keep it around three minutes if we can, um, <laughs> as best we as best we can for for speaker. But, um, I would ask, and I would ask if you know if anybody speaking in opposition or in favor, either one. If, if somebody before you has said the same things and you're just going to reiterate it, um, we, we kind of we don't need a whole lot of that. So um, just keep that in mind as you get up to speak. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board, my name is John Adcock, the Adcock Law Firm located at 202 East Academy Street here in Fuqua Verena. I represent the petitioner uh, in this rezoning case and land use map uh, amendment case. Um, I'll go over those documents that they're circulating now in just a moment. Uh, Wakefield Development is the uh, petitioner in this matter and my client. Uh, also here tonight is uh, Gary Metvin, Matthew Danielson, both from Wakefield Development and Kelly Race, which is the project engineer with BGE Engineering. The, the uh, package I just distributed to you guys is broken down into several parts, and I apologize my color printer was not being cooperative this afternoon, but uh, the first thing you see is a, uh, a it's entitled memorandum, but this is a timeline of the process that's been involved with this, uh, with this rezoning and land use amendment. Just after that, you'll see a letter dated November 5th, 2021, which represents uh, the first round of responses to comments from the town staff. And then just behind that, maybe three or four pages back, you'll see uh, a letter or document dated December the 3rd, 2021, which is the response of the petitioner to the second round of comments from the staff. And then you're gonna see an old fashioned uh, GIS map there. I'll go over that in just a minute towards the back. And the very back, there's a, um, a printed version of the land use plan, the land use map, and I'll go over that in, uh, in just a few minutes. So regarding the process, I mean, this process started in April of 2021. Um, and I think it's important to keep in mind, uh, it, it's critical, it's critically important, um, because the, the petitioner has been involved in this for nine months. And... Um, the product that you see in front of you is presented tonight is a product of that nine month journey. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of variables at play uh, during this process. One, my client has a contract with a property owner. Uh, there are timelines in that contract that are critical. And in order to alter those timelines, there has to be amendments to contracts, which includes getting agreements from all parties involved. Uh, you also have the time, energy, and effort that's spent in preparing this plan and designing it. Um, but you can look through that list of dates and you can see the process that played out. 
Um, and, and I want to emphasize too, and my client emphasized, and I, I knew this already because I do so much work in Fuquay, but staff has been exceptional again, uh, as they always are. Um, Pam and her department are responsive, um, very, uh, do a great job. Um, and we're very lucky to have them in Fuquay Verena. Um, but the, um, one of the things you'll see, if you look down on the timeline, sec second page, you'll see on December 6, 2021, my client was informed that the planning staff was going to provide a favorable recommendation uh, on this case, land use amendment and the rezoning amendment. And then on December the 10th, three or four days later, uh, that recommendation was changed to denial. Uh, to my knowledge, to my client's knowledge, there was no change in conditions or anything uh, that we've made aware of that occurred during that three or four day period that would cause that change in the recommendation. Um, so, you know, keep in mind, up until December 6, we had a nine, eight, nine month process that was playing out, uh, working on uh, addressing questions and comments by the staff. And then we get, we think we're, we're good. And then all of a sudden, three or four days later, we're told we're not. Um, another thing that plays out during this process is these architectural controls. And under state law, local governments cannot require architectural standards for one and two family single family dwellings. Um, now there's a process in the conditions owning process is a process where we're going back and forth with conditions. And that's part of what has gone on for the last seven, eight, nine months. Um, look, my client and myself, we agree uh, that there's the need for revision to the land use plan, uh, specifically this property. Um, but we also understand that as a part of comprehensive land use planning, uh, there's a continual reevaluation of a land use plan and the need to update it. And we understand the town's needs to do that and respect that and, and, uh, and understand that that's something that's important for this town and any local government to do. But what we don't understand is how we can get so deep in the process after the town has started the land use revision process and not uh, really be um, you know, informed of why over about a three or four day period after eight or nine months of work, something, a recommendation was changed completely 180 degrees. Uh, we, it's just something we just don't have an understanding of why that is the case. Um, there have been some things that have changed, uh, and, you know, and land use plans, uh, as the town is seeing, or, or, you know, the reason you go back and look at them is because uh, you need to make sure that because changing conditions, uh, things need to be reevaluated. And uh, some of the changing conditions regarding this, specifically with the commercial component, and that's the, that's the big issue here, at least I perceive that to be the big, big issue, um, what my client is proposing is something that's a, uh, only residential land uses, um, single family townhouses, attached townhomes, and single family uh, lar larger lots. Um, the land use plan was adopted in June of 2017. Uh, in July of 2017, talking about changing conditions, you know, there were 2,216 new listings in the Triangle MLS in July of 2017. In November of 2021, there were 1,530 new listings. Um, the median, the average sales price of a home in July 2017, according to Triangle Multiple Listing Service, was $327,000 and change. This past November, it was $477,000. Uh, days on market uh, in July of 2017 was basically 33 days. As of November 2021, days on market of new single-family homes is 10 days. Uh, the inventory of homes in the market in July of 2017 was 3,830. In November of 2021, it was 1,005. And the months of supply of single-family residences, according to Triangle Multiple Listing Service, in this market in July of 2017 was 2.2 months. In November of 2021, it's 0.5. It's half a month. So that is a changing condition. The housing market, we have huge demand and low inventory. Uh, and we think that's one of the variables that needs to be considered when, when reviewing this matter uh, regarding the commercial, the commercial component. We've also, in, we're still in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, as we're all aware, remote working has become more and more prevalent. And based on everything I've seen, it's probably something that's going to continue out into the future. Uh, some of us are happy about that, some maybe not. Uh, we also have the evolution of e-commerce. And again, I'm speaking directly to the commercial component that the town staff uh, has indicated would need to be part of this to get a favorable recommendation. Um, another change condition is construction of I-540. Um, there's no interchange at 540 in Lake Wheeler Road, okay? Now, when you look at the land use map, you'll see that this 
property was designated with the uh, MUN designation uh, right at the intersection where uh, right where 540 and uh, Lake Wheeler Road are, are meeting. Um, there's no intersection there. Um, in 2020, the property owner deeded approximately six point over six acres of land to DOT for the 540 right of way. And if you look at the GIS map I have in the um, next to last page, sorry, my color printer was not cooperating, but you can clearly see the, the impact 540 has had on this property. It was, as I said, more than six acres of land dedicated or deeded as right of way. And as a result of that, you'll see this small triangle that is actually part of this property, but not part of this petition uh, to the south. That's over one acre of land that was basically just cut off and separated from the parent track and is not part of this petition. So when the land use plan was, was developed in 2017, this was a different looking piece of property. It was very different. 540 was not mapped through there. It wasn't the right of way had not been deeded over. Um, and I think that there is uh, information that indicates that there was con it was contemplated that intersection interchange would be at Lake Wheeler Road, but it's not. Um, and so there's roughly eight acres of land that has been impacted by this by the 540. And also you're seeing a lot of linear uh, uh, feet of, of road frontage that has been taken away as a result of this. So this is a very different property than it was in 2017 when the land use plan was developed. There's also, you know, within a mile of this property, uh, maybe a little bit more than a mile, but there's, there's hundreds of thousands of square feet of commercial uh, uses at the intersection of 401 and 1010. Uh, you've got Costco, you've got all the other things that have been there. Um, this is not a property uh, where a commercial use is going to have, have any success. It just doesn't set up. It's small, and there's other options available. It's just not going to work. Um, now, regarding, if you look to the last page of the information I gave you, a copy of the land use plan, I'm not suggesting I hit every single uh, MUN land use designation, but I think I've got most of them. I identified 11, 11 and you'll see numbers uh, on the... Um, on the land use plan. Those are my edits. Uh, you'll see the numbers that are identified there. Uh, number one is a subject property. You'll see up where 540 crosses Lake Wheeler Road. Number two is over at 1010. And I, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but the bottom line is the theme you will see is that with the MUN land use designation, most, ex with a few exceptions, including this property, the MUN land designation is at major interchanges or along heavily traveled roads that is more uh, susceptible to commercial uh, development. Um, that is not the case with this property. It's not near a significant interchange, uh, at least not directly. And, uh, you know, the traffic volume compared to other roads where the MUN are, des are designated is, is minimal. Another aspect of this property is that this property was part of the ETJ expansion in 2019. Uh, if you recall, in 2019, the town of Fuqua Verena petitioned or submitted to the Wake County requesting over 22,000 acres of land be added to the town's ex-territory jurisdiction. Uh, what came out of that was roughly, I think around half or maybe a little less than half of that request was, was agreed to by the county. But this property was part of that. I mean, this property was not, they didn't, you know, this is not a situation where somebody came in and asked to be annexed. I mean, this is where the town went out and, and without consent of the landowner, uh, you know, annexed in their property. I'm not saying it was wrong doing that, but that's just a fact. Uh, that's what occurred. Um, and when you look, you know, the Wake County Board of Commissioners has a set of seven criteria for evaluating an ETJ expansion. Um, one is the commitment to comprehensive planning. Another is a commitment to provide municipal water and sewer within five years of the effective date of the ETJ expansion. And another is the property should be capable, be capable of being developed to an average density feasible for municipal annexation with annexation most likely occurring within 10 years. You know, we've had some comments back on this matter and some others that I'm dealing with, that there's a utility issue, capacity issue, um, and there, that very well may be. Um, but I do want to emphasize that this property was taken into the ETJ with the commitment from the town to provide full uh, water and sewer, sewer availability within five years. Um, and by the time, you know, the development process, the way it happens, you go through the entitlement process, you know, basically you're a two or three, two plus year process of getting a property from contract signing to closing when it's fully entitled. 
my point in making that is we're not far off in the five years uh, once this property would be um, going vertical. Um, but the commitment to comprehensive planning, I mean, you know, we're looking at a land use plan. Again, we agree the land use plan needs to be updated. Uh, we support that, and specifically with this property. Um, but um, the, what is playing out now is my client has been told, as other people in the development community are being told, to stand down and wait to a land use plan amendment is completed. Well, to my knowledge, it's not been defined. I know that in general terms, it's been defined in the spring of this year. Um, but I've seen no public information indicating, I mean, the public the planning process involves public participation. And up to this point, we've seen none of that. So, you know, I don't doubt the town has a goal of getting this land use plan updated uh, sometime later this year, uh, in the spring perhaps. But my client has a contract running um, and is spending a lot of money in the entitlement process and is being told to just hold and delay until we have a chance to do this. It's inherently unfair. Um, the property itself, you know, you've got some environmental constraints. You've got a blue line stream that traverses the property. Um, the property is surrounded by residential uses. Uh, the density proposed at 3.38 per acre, I mean, that is a low density project. That is very low. And under the mixed density residential land use classification, it could be between four to eight units per acre. You've got a requirement of 20% of open space. This project has 40% as dedicated open space. That's, just, that's doubling what the requirements are. So in closing, you know, I mean, we understand the land, support and understand that land use plans need to be updated. Uh, and that's what we're proposing to do here. Now, what I would suggest to you is that we understand we're facing a negative or a, a recommendation for denial by the town staff. If the planning consultant is willing and the staff is willing, you know, you know, we're willing to set this thing aside for another month to let the land use consultant look at this plan and come back and let us, my clients, know how it fares, along with the town staff, uh, to come back to the planning board in 30 days and say, hey, here's what the planning consultant came back with. Um, but if, you know, if we're not going to, we've got an, in, an undefined specific timeline for the land use update to occur, um, you know, we need to get some answers about how, how this is going to play out. Um, and I think that's a fair offer, uh, you know, to say, hey, let's let the land use consultant look at it, come back, and we can come back to this board and discuss what that looks like. Um, but, you know, there's been, to my knowledge, there's been no significant opposition to what's being proposed. Um, when you look at the guiding principles of the land use plan, I mean, you know, you've got affordable housing issues, you've got a, a plan that proposes a mixture of housing types uh, in a market that, you know, we hear consistently, we need more affordable housing. This is a great product. It's a plan unit development that allows for flexibility. And, um, you know, it really sets up well, but commercial is just not suitable for this site. Uh, and if, if it's gonna be forced to have, if, if, you know, the town is gonna eventually, if somebody comes in and puts commercial there, maybe way out in the future, there might be some promise of that happening. But as of right now in the near future, it's just not something that really sets up well for this property at all. So, that's all I have. I'd be glad to address any questions if you have any. And we also have the project engineer members of my client's staff here as well. Do you have any questions, Mr. Haricot? I have one for you. Um, and it's just so we can understand, um, I understand completely what you're saying with contracts and due diligence and timelines and all that good stuff and money at risk. And But in this document that you handed us, and, and maybe Kelly can, can help us more understand it, what occurred between April 29th and September 28th? There's a five month period in there that from a pre-development meeting to when it got submitted. So is there something that happened in between that time that we need to be aware of? Because that's five months of stagnation that I'm trying to well, that, piece in my mind with the timeline together of well, there we was, got to this point. There was April 29th to July 21st is the two. And that one says July 21st is just a meeting to discuss sewer capacity. I get that, that's three months. And then from July 21st to September 28th. So we went from the 29th of a pre-development to the 28th in September of a pre-submittal. So was there something in dialogue that happened in between that and that five months that's 